Welcome back, everyone. Um, I think we'll move on to our, our, our next session right now, which is called Changing the Framework. And we're going to do a little bit of imagining, I think, right now. I'm hoping with the benefit of some great speakers. Um, uh, the, the, the panel before, before this, uh, and Dean Mino as well, has they've given us some excellent uh, philosophical ideas to start with about where we need to go and why. Uh, so I want to take a look at what would a different system of punishment, if we still call it that, look like? Um, we're going to blue sky a bit, whether things are immediately practical or not, but I'd like to, to um, get our get some ideas from some of the people we have on the table uh, and just sort of whip around uh, some ideas with your questions and how do we balance, obviously, public safety with the idea of rehabilitation. Um, do we need to rethink front end decisions on sentencing? The trial penalty is some call it. Um, and once people are in or behind bars or under confinement, uh, what do we do with them? And are there better ways to treat them? So to help us um, in those discussions, we've got a number of people. If you look at your agenda, um, the bios are also available that you have separately. But I want to start in the order in which we're um, going to be speaking. Uh, I want to start first with the Honorable Angel, uh, Angel Harris, um, who is a... Um, elected to the Orleans Parish Criminal Court District in November of 2020, and she served previously as the Assistant Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, um, where her advocacy focused on capital defense, on juvenile life without the possibility of parole, felon disenfranchisement, and policing reform. Um, so Judge Harris, over to you. All right, you thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm going to uh, apologize in advance. I am a little tired. I, I just got off a plane at midnight from Dubai. So <laughs> if I, you know, I'm a little uh, tired, I, I apologize in advance. But I was excited um, when I was asked to do this panel, uh, even knowing that I would be getting off my flight, I, I couldn't pass up this opportunity because I think it's so important to have this conversation, particularly with journalists. Um, I think when we're talking about changing the framework, journalists play such a key role in ensuring that we are reshaping and really reconfiguring how we're talking about criminal justice reform and how we're talking about our criminal court system in general. Um, you mentioned that I was elected in uh, last year. So today is actually a year <laughs> since I've been elected and it's, it's still, I'm still processing and I'm still going through um, and realizing like I am on the bench. Um, and so one of the things that I can say and that I'll talk a lot about is my campaign was essentially reimagining our criminal court system. What does that look like? What does that mean? Particularly when we're talking about criminal court, right? Because we're talking about a system of what I like to call a system of accountability, more so than uh, framing it in punitive terms. And so when I say, let's reimagine, Let's think about how we can still hold individuals accountable for their actions, but also really thinking about and understanding the root causes that bring people in front of me in court. And I thought uh, that was something that I felt was lacking. And that's why I decided to run for judge. Because when I was a public defender in New Orleans, I noticed that oftentimes if my client was struggling with substance abuse or if my client was struggling with mental health challenges, those were never addressed by the court. It was simply a one size fits all, send them to prison. And so I, I felt that needed to change. And part of it is what we're talking about today is sort of this changing the framework. If we're coming at it from a different angle, then I think it would be much easier for us to do away with the one size fits all. It will be much easier for us to say, I've noticed that this individual has a long list of thefts, but, but they seem to be very petty thefts. This person is stealing from Walmart. This person is stealing from, you know, stealing the essential goods that they need. Why is this? Or when we think about an individual who has mental health challenges, we see that when this person is off their meds, that's when they're coming in front of the court. However, when this person is on their meds, they are, you know, 
fine and functioning and, and contributing to society. So how can we, myself particularly as judges, what can I do when I see that and how we can change that? And one of the things that I make sure that I do, one, I think it makes it easier that I was a public defender. So when I look at cases, I'm looking at them from a different angle. I'm looking at them from a different viewpoint. And one uh, thing that we can, the first thing we can start doing is realizing and recognizing, particularly when we're talking about journalists, that words matter. How you frame someone or, or the words that you use when you are reporting about certain things, that frames the entire conversation. One of the things that I, I don't allow in my courtroom when I'm speaking of someone, I don't refer to anyone who, in my court as a felon. I refer to someone who was previously convicted or someone who has a record, but they are not a felon. I try not to use any of those labels in court because once you stamp someone with that word felon, particularly in the United States and specifically in Louisiana, that means a lot of things. There are a lot of collateral consequences that come with that, and there are a lot of stigmas that come with that. And so first, taking that out of the picture. Also, when you are addressing individuals one of the things that we don't talk enough about when we talk about how people prefer to be referred and you know we're talking about gender pronouns or we're talking about uh, those different aspects, that makes a big deal as well because oftentimes when people are in front of the court as a defendant in the court, they feel invisible and their names are never mentioned. You know, people will say, oh, the defendant is stepping up and they'll, men they'll say Mr. So-and-so to the attorney, but only refer to their client as the defendant. So what I do, I make sure to say, Mr. Smith, you know, acknowledging Mr. Smith, because this is Mr. Smith's case. He's being assisted by that attorney, but it is Mr. Smith's case. And the same even goes when we're talking about victims. You know, there are some, there are some cases where you don't want to mention the victim's name for privacy purposes, but you want to acknowledge that if there is another person on the end of that, if this is a crime that involves a victim or a complaining witness, that that person is being acknowledged in the conversation. And so I think just small conscious decisions, when we are really thinking about how we're framing things, what words we're using, that can change the framework. I think too, we need to make sure that we, are start, we start rooting things in data and that we aren't just, particularly when we're talking about journalists, because when most people, their exposure to the criminal court system is what they read in the newspaper. Unless they themselves are involved in the criminal court system or a family member, they only know about what they read. And so if they hear something that's not based in facts, they are going to take it as fact because a journalist or the media presented it as such. And so I think that there's such a large responsibility for the media to ensure that what they are saying is accurate information and just ensuring that they understand also what's going on. Sometimes what's happening in court may be a bit more complicated. And you know, while judges can't talk about specific cases, judges can ensure that facts are being, um, that facts are, are correct when we are talking about something. So if you reach out to a judge and ask what happened in court on that date, they can tell you that. They can't go through their specific deliberations, but if there's a clarification that's needed on the process, then judges can absolutely answer and are happy to answer those questions. And um, when, I, when we start talking about reforms and we start talking about changes, I think what's important is when individuals, you know, like myself are trying a, a new way of doing something, um, you know, to really just um, make sure that you're not just focusing on some of the negative things that may come from it, but that it's a well-rounded conversation. Because oftentimes you people can fall into the fear mongering, which is, which is what I refer to it as, you know, and they're saying, oh, all of these people are being released and crime has gone up, you know, uh, however percentage. But if you're not framing it correctly, then that's not fair for you to say. And oftentimes, if you look at the data and you look at the timing of things, what is being asserted as fact isn't correct. Um, when you start talking about bail reform and you start talking about people who are being released and then there may be an uptick in um, arrests or there may be an uptick in crime, you can't automatically assume that that is related to 
bond being um, lowered on individuals. You also have to think about different social economic factors that might be going on. You have to think about COVID-19. You have to think about people losing their jobs. You have to think about certain communities that may have been uh, once again, I live in Louisiana, certain communities that may have been destroyed by natural disasters or individuals who have been impacted by natural disasters such as Hurricane Katrina and how those can manifest over time. And so it's just important to think about the historical context, data, and also to just be careful with the words that you are using. And I think if we are doing those things and looking at the root causes, we really can change the framework and we really can create a system that's sustainable and create a system that not only um, promotes public safety, but it also promotes public health. And that was one of the things that was very important to me. I had conversations with individuals. I sat on porches and I talked to them about, you know, the fact that Louisiana leads the nation in incarceration, yet New Orleans isn't the safest city in the United States. And so why is that? So let's have those conversations. What are ways that we can really start changing and improving our communities? And that is what and I think that's why, you know, individuals were comfortable electing me because I, I wanted to talk about the entire picture and I cared about the community as a whole. And we can't stigmatize entire communities and also say that we're doing something that's in their interest if we haven't had the conversations with those individuals. And so I'll just uh, wrap up my comments for there and I'm happy to answer any other questions, but again, data, using the right words and really just reframing and rethinking about how we're approaching criminal justice reform. Thank you, Judge Harris. Erin um, Kelly is a professor of philosophy at Tufts University. She's the author of The Limits of Blame, Rethinking Punishment and Responsibility, which just criticizes the role of blame in popular theories of criminal justice. So it's a good segue uh, from what Judge Harris said. Erin? Thanks very much for including me on this panel and in this conference on such an important topic. So I'm really um, glad to be a part of it and have been learning a lot already. So I'm a philosopher, not a public policy expert. And the focus of my remarks is not how we should punish differently, but rather how we should think differently about the people we punish. I think we should be less retributive and more generally less moralistic in our attitudes toward criminal defendants and those who have been criminally convicted. I think that a shift in our thinking about criminal guilt would lead us to punish less and to seek alternative approaches to the social problems that have been relegated to the criminal justice system. So my remarks begin from ideas I developed in my book, The Limits of Blame. There, I argued that the practice of assigning blame through the American criminal justice system has gone beyond a pragmatic need for protection and a moral need to repudiate harmful acts, and that it represents a desire for retribution that's come to normalize excessive punishment. Retributive theories of justice are organized around the idea that the purpose of the criminal justice system is to give criminal offenders the punishment they deserve. What criminal wrongdoers deserve, according to retributive theories, is to suffer in proportion to their culpable wrongdoing. So retributivists believe that justice demands the imposition of suffering on criminal wrongdoers. I think the American criminal justice system encourages this way of thinking about justice by purporting to align legal criteria of guilt with moral criteria of blameworthiness. So in this way, it licenses the inference that the criminal, criminally guilty are morally blameworthy. Uh, but many incarcerated people, um, as we've been discussing, for example, those who are mentally ill, perhaps those who are desperately poor, may not be blameworthy or as blameworthy for their criminal acts, even when they're criminally guilty. So we tend to exaggerate the moral meaning of criminal guilt. Now, I don't think that a blaming orientation is responsible for the problem of mass incarceration. Practices of blame and moral condemnation directed at people who've been convicted of crimes don't explain why the criminal justice is so brutal. To understand that, we have to look to factors that extend beyond our moral attitude toward criminal lawbreakers as such, specifically racial injustice and the stigma of blackness, excessive fear of crime, 
extreme income and wealth inequality, and other social problems. The dynamics of blame that concern me intersect with those of racial and socioeconomic injustice, but I wouldn't say that the popularity of the retributive sen sentiments is the driving force behind over-incarceration. Still, I believe the idea of retributive justice and more generally our society's investment in blaming criminal wrong lawbreakers serves to rationalize the practice of punishment in a way that decreases empathy for people who are caught up in the criminal justice system. It does so by maintaining that they deserve to be hurt and cast out. The practice of blaming criminal offenders normalizes punishment, and it does so even when punishment is excessive, as it is in our criminal justice system. So in my brief time, my point will be that background injustice, specifically the socioeconomic inequality that disproportionately burdens Black Americans, unsettles the ethical basis of individual criminal responsibility, creating a crisis for criminal law. The law is caught between an ethical mode of individual accountability on the one hand and group focused measures of social control on the other. And these, the tensions between these modes raise, I think, special difficulties for retributive modes of thinking about criminal justice. Many philosophies of criminal justice are grounded in an understanding of accountability that follows the paradigm of a normal, healthy individual who has freely chosen to do wrong and whose wrongdoing demonstrates a problem with the wrongdoer's will or character. So this paradigm of individual accountability is embedded in the law itself. The cr a crime is defined as a legally prohibited act that is voluntarily committed by a criminal agent with a guilty mind. A voluntary act is any movement of the body that is under control of the agent's will. So voluntary, voluntariness excludes only completely willless, lack of voluntary, voluntariness excludes only completely willless movements like seizures or being forcefully carried. And the law's threshold of guilt for mental states is also weak. Legally, excluding, exclu, legally excusing abnormality requires a showing of insanity which represents the extreme end of the spectrum of mental illness. So the result is that most people are accountable actors in the eyes of the law. People are legally accountable for conduct that involves voluntary movements of their bodies and the relevant intention, knowledge, or carelessness that's not the product of an utter inability to appreciate the difference between right and wrong. So we're legally accountable for almost everything we do. This broad notion of criminal responsibility is hard to reconcile with something we know, namely that the causes of both crime and punishment are systematic as much as individual. In fact, both crime and punishment have many causes and these causes extend well beyond individual exercises of free will. Causes of crime are found not only in criminal agency, that is criminal choices that individual persons make and could have refrained from making, but also in the circumstances that help to explain the choices people make. Criminologists ask, for example, why it is that crime rates are higher in certain neighborhoods or among a certain segment of the population defined, for example, by income level, race, age, or educational attainment. So individual choice is an uninteresting background condition against which the causal relevance of these factors is explored. And social scientists have found that criminal choices are influenced by poverty, racial discrimination, racial segregation, educational deprivation, lack of adult supervision, weak community support, and joblessness, amongst other factors. Empirical researchers have also documented racial discrimination in rates of arrest, criminal prosecution, and sentencing. So ours is a system of selective accountability. Race and socio socioeconomic status influences influence who attracts the interest of law enforcement, as well as who among the guilty gets punished and how much. Though the discretion, through the discretion afforded to law enforcement in surveillance, investigation, arrest, 
prosecution, and punishment, where there's wide discretion in all of these domains of law enforcement, criminal justice operates in a mode of social control with demographic markers. Legal scholar Paul Butler puts the historical record starkly in this way. Black men are the prototypical criminals in the eyes of the law. Attention to systematic causes of criminalization and crime is strikingly at odds with the traditional individualized understanding of accountability in the law, and this presents a challenge for thinking about criminal justice. The circumstances of criminal justice that make sense of the individual accountability paradigm do not include a wide variety of factors that explain crime and punishment. And while this isn't surprising, and there's certain reasons for having an individual accountability system, it's also disturbing. So under structurally unjust circumstances, criminal choices do not represent free choices made under a set of decent alternatives. And this complicates the ethical evaluation of those choices. Sometimes criminal choices are clearly bad choices, even under unjust circumstances. Sometimes they're poor choices that people understandably make under circumstances of, for example, poverty, alienation, and despair. Sometimes they represent relatively good choices in relation to serious human need. And sometimes they are arguably legitimate acts of protest against unjust circumstances themselves. So we have two competing levels of description for criminal law. On the one hand, Criminal law has an internal logic as a system of individual accountability. Individual actors are liable for how they choose to act. On the other hand, criminal law displays a group-focused social control function. The criminal law's attention is trained on certain socially salient groups, namely the most seriously disadvantaged. To that extent, the co social control function of criminal law is rooted in unjust social structures for which the society bears collective responsibility. Yet the logic of accountability in criminal law leaves no formal institutional way to acknowledge the social context of the criminal justice system. So the ethical grammar of criminal law, if you will, contains no account of social injustice. So my takeaway point is this, we should give up on the idea that criminal conviction implies deserved suffering. We should acknowledge collective responsibility for the legal structures and social conditions that offer promising opportunities to privileged people and a fast track to prison for those who have been most excluded from the rights and opportunities of democratic membership. So in the United States, a black male without a high school diploma is 170 times, 175 times more likely to go to prison than a white man with a college education, or so I've read. This is not meaningfully understood in terms of individual choice. The current criminal justice crisis calls for a remedy that includes serious socioeconomic transformation and, I would add, a historically conscious effort at reparative justice. So I think we should keep this in mind as we discuss criminal justice reform and as we explore uh, attractive alternatives to punishment like restorative justice. Thanks, Professor Glenn. Let me just stop for a second and tease out one really interesting thread from what you just said, and maybe just toss it around with the other uh, speakers as well. We seem to have an issue in the American justice system of whether we punish character or whether we punish behavior. And very often what you're describing is, I think it's a system which punishes behavior, or punishes character rather. We're punishing a person uh, for being who he is or who she is, rather than looking at the specific actions. Would you agree with that? Is that a, is that a place where we might try to begin reforming? I think the legal procedures are designed around deciding whether a person committed a criminal act but the culture around the criminal justice system and the rationales for punishment seem to license us from a judgment about whether this act was right. committed to a conclusion about the character and moral worthiness of the person who committed the act. And that's what I'm saying isn't licensed given everything we know about, you know, what causes crime, the background injustice that, you know, people are struggling with. 
that le- that le- that inference is not licensed and it really leads us astray i think to increase the appeal of the retributive notion of justice as you know deserved punishment and that we should resist that that has deep roots in our culture and our system all the way back to the uh, you know, the Puritan New England, when we looked at ways to change character as a way to stop crime. Um, I think, let me move on right now to um, uh, Sidney McKinney, uh, who's the executive director of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. Um, Dr. McKinney has over 15 years of experience in areas of child welfare and justice reform. Um, I'm hoping she'll tell us a little bit about the National Black Women's Justice Institute. Um, and obviously we do know, and what's really uh, not covered as well as it should be, is, is um, uh, the increasing incarceration of women in our system, and even more so the incarceration of black women. So uh, that's one of the areas where reform, or certainly where more coverage and more, more knowledge is needed. Uh, but uh, Ms. McKinney, over to you. Thank you so very much um, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And I just wanted to actually react to the question you threw out there about are we um, judging people based on their moral character? And I think it's actually that we are making decisions based on the biases and the stereotypes that we hold about people. Because character suggests that this is something about the person that they hold, believe, and think about themselves and how they actually carry themselves in the world. But the realities that we see in the data bear this out is that we are making decisions about what the labels and the meaning that we associate with the identity that we see. And often that is race and also it is gender um, and that the work that we do really talk about the way and explore the ways in which gender is weaponized um, against women. So I just wanted to say that in in response to the question. Uh, So thank you all so much for having me. Um, As he said, I am Sydney McKinney and I am the executive director of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. The mission of our organization is to end the criminalization of black women and girls. Like Black men, Black women are disproportionately overrepresented in the criminal legal system. And unfortunately, their experiences and their narratives are virtually invisible. And so the aim of our organization is to elevate their stories and their experiences so that we can identify community-led solutions to violence and crime that are really rooted in healing. Um, I'm excited to be here to be part of this discussion about changing the framework because that's exactly what NBWJI is working towards. We want to eliminate the punitive paradigm on which the US criminal legal system was built and which perpetuates racial and gender oppression in this country. A system born from those values cannot bring about justice of any kind, nor can it support our individual and collective healing, which is the true meaning of justice, in my opinion. Reimagining and building a new system of justice requires that we dismantle and dispel many of the myths that hold it together so that we can start to fundamentally shift the narrative about what justice actually is and looks like. How we talk about the criminal legal system, the language we use and the stories we tell perpetuate, reinforce and legitimize the horrific system of punishment that exists in this country. Once we start to elevate new stories, new narratives, new voices, particularly those of directly impacted people, we can start to chart a new system of justice that is restorative and actually keeps all of our communities safe. So today I wanna talk to you about two narratives that get in the way of our pursuit of real justice. The first is the victim offender dichotomy and the second is that prisons are rehabilitative. Uh, So by no means is this an exhaustive list of prison mythology we need to eliminate, but it's where I'm hoping we can start today. So often in the media on crime, we see and we hear words like offender, ex-offender, criminal, felon, perpetrator. And these words are used to define and label the person who has caused harm. But these labels are overly simplistic and incredibly problematic. And using this terminology, we ignore and we take away the humanity of people who have caused harm. We put them in a box and we let a moment of bad decision making, unlikely the worst day of their life, become how we define them. But all of us, including people who have caused harm, are so complex with a lifetime of experiences that shape us and our actions, but in no way define who we are. 
So we must ask ourselves, what's the purpose in using this kind of language? What purpose does it serve? Uh, what does it prevent us from seeing and acknowledging about people who have caused harm? And how might our system function different, differently if we started viewing people who have caused harm as whole complex people as they are? If we started seeing people who have caused harm as whole people with all of their complexities, one thing we'd notice is that the vast majority of people who are in prisons and jails are survivors of trauma. The overlap between who has caused harm and people who have been harmed is well documented in research literature. Some research suggests genetic similarities, behavioral traits, and even situational factors are the link but the most convincing argument I've seen in the literature and aligns with what I've heard from directly impacted Black women contends that individuals who are committed, who have, who have committed crimes and or have caused harm have experienced greater exposure to adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences are potentially traumatizing incidents in a person's life that occur before age 17. And these incidents include things like abuse, neglect, sexual violence, death of a caregiver, and witnessing community violence. So the research tells us that a higher a person's ACE score, the more likely it is that they may go on and cause harm in the future. All of the women and girls I know and have worked with who are directly impacted by the criminal legal system have distressingly high ACE scores. The Vera Institute of Justice published a report in 2016 indicating that 86% of women in jails are survivors of sexual violence. 77% were survivors of intimate partner violence and 60% were survivors of caregiver violence. And other studies show even higher rates. There's a, 19, a study from 1999 of women incarcerated at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in New York that found that over 80% of the women in the facility reported that they were survivors of child sexual and physical abuse, and over 90% of them reported experiencing sexual violence at some point in their lifetime. So the data completely dispel the idea that we have a quote-unquote victim on one side and a quote-unquote offender on the other. In truth, we have on both sides, people who have been harmed, um, who've been harmed by crime and who are survivors of harm. And it's long overdue that our criminal legal system recognize and become responsive to that fact. So why do we continue to hold on to this victim offender myth and continue to use language that denies people their human dignity? Um, and I think it's because it legitimizes and clouds the true intentions of prisons and jails. Prisons weren't, were built to punish and cause harm. And that's a harder sell when the public knows you're punishing people who are also victims and um, have been let down by our society and its social, political, and economic institutions. Now, some people may push back and say that prisons and jails are meant to be re rehabilitative, but if prisons were intended to be places of rehabilitation and restoration, we would not have a system that allows people to be sentenced for 25 or 50 years or to be sentenced to life or death. Let's for a second evaluate prisons from a public health framework. If it takes 25 or more years to rehabilitate someone, isn't there something wrong with your intervention? If a person serves out their sentence and is reincarcerated, wouldn't you say your intervention doesn't work? If it causes the exact same outcome it was meant to prevent, isn't there a problem? These are clear indicators of the failures of prisons and jails, and they show us that prisons do not rehabilitate or prevent crime. Research unequivocally shows us that pris prisons are actually criminogenic, which means that they cause crime and criminal offending. My background is in program evaluation, and if prisons were held to the same standards as public health interventions, they would be shut down immediately, no questions asked. We would not stand for the level, degree, and severity of harm that prisons inflict. Yet they continue to exist, which tells us that the motivations and intent for maintaining prisons and jails has nothing to do with the long dispelled myth that they keep us safe and prevent crime. Prisons do one thing, and that's cause harm. That's what they were intended to do. That's what they were designed to do. And there's abundant evidence of how successfully they achieved that goal.
but we can rebuild a new system of justice that acknowledges the dignity of all people, that is designed to restore and help people and can help our communities be safe. And that starts by changing our mental models and the frameworks upon which the criminal legal system and penal systems were built. And we do this by shifting the narratives. As journalists, you can help us with that. You can stop pushing the stories that reinforce the status quo and start telling stories that go deep and excavate the roots of the problems of our current system. Tell the stories that expose the harm that people who are incarcerated are subjected to. Tell the stories of directly impacted people, not just the stories of their crimes. Start using person-centered language instead of defaulting to the harmful labels that exist. Elevate research and reports that provide insight into impact and the consequences of how our criminal legal system currently operates. And tell the stories of the people and the organizations who are working to transform our criminal legal system. Your work is so vital in helping our society relinquish the idea that justice is retribution. And you can help us embrace the notion that justice is restoration and healing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. McKinney. So, thank you, Dr. McKinney. Let me get mad. So, um, some really, really good ideas there. And I want to go back to them in our discussion. But first, I want to move over to uh, uh, Stephanie Morales, who is the first woman elected Commonwealth attorney in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, quick correction in some uh, versions of the agenda that you have, it lists Portsmouth, Portsmouth as being in West Virginia, uh, which of course it isn't. Uh, so, we apologize for that correction. Um, uh, Ms. Morales is a mother of four. She committed her office to seeking restorative justice daily and correcting wrongs done by the system to members of the community. And she is another author, but she's a children's book author. One of the latest books she's done is called The Day I Became a Lawyer, which sounds incredibly intriguing. Um, Ms. Morales, over to you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am incredibly happy to be here with you guys having this conversation. Um, it is not often that I in my position meet with a group uh, of people who are committed to trying to think about journalism and how that has an impact on our communities and on our criminal legal system and its function. So um, I think this is a very important discussion. And I want to be very clear in some of the things that I have um, encountered and my time as the elected Commonwealth attorney as a black woman, someone who was elected at 31 years old um, and that particular struggle. So for me, um, I've been elected going on seven years. It will be seven years in February. I was just formally reelected yesterday um, for my third term. So <laughs> uh, it's exciting. Um, like Judge Harris, I'm a little tired today too. Um, but it's, this is an amazing cause, so I'm very glad to be a part of this discussion. Um, so I have to say it's very important um, when putting stories out and telling the stories of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis and engaging with our communities, it's critically important to think about, you know, looking at the humanity, uh, for one, looking at the humanity of those who you're thinking about writing about, but also thinking about the humanity of those who are working to change and transform this system. Um, and, you know, looking at not running away from conversations that we have not wanted to have in this society for far too long, like the fact that all systems of power are rooted in systemic racism. Um, you know, I have had many opportunities to speak uh, at lots of different public forums. And when I bring up systemic racism and when I talk about how we can address removing races from the equation, People nod their heads and then they get very quiet and I don't hear anybody engaging deeper in that conversation about systemic racism and about racist actors and about racist police and people in positions of authority and power who are willing to hold members of our community accountable, but who are not willing to hold themselves accountable or hold each other accountable. Um, so one of the things that happened very early on in my first term was that I had an 18 year old African-American young man in my community. His name was William Chapman II. He was shot and killed by a police officer. Um, and I fast forward and going very quickly through this, I indicted that police officer within, within four months um, of this incident, sat first chair on that case myself, tried a year's worth of pretrial motions, tried a week long jury trial first chair and ended up with a voluntary manslaughter conviction. And what I experienced from three months into my first term all the way throughout the course of that trial, 
was a lot of journalists who were interested in being concerned about my age, the fact that I was 31 years old, comparing me to the defense attorneys um, who were much older, um, really digging into me as an individual and trying to, you know, really tear down um, some of the things that I was working on instead of, again, paying attention to the facts, looking at the humanity of my victim. Um, it was really unfortunate to have to feel as a Black woman um, the targets that I had that my white predecessor, who was a conservative, you know, who had been in office for around 12 to 14 years, none of those questions were asked of him when he justified police officer shooting cases. Um, there were very specific um, problematic and harmful challenges that I faced and that I know a lot of my Black women counterparts across this nation who are doing this work, whether they are elected Commonwealth attorneys or DAs, whether they are activists, whether they're judges, no matter what positions of authority they're in, we have a different experience. And so when you see, if you want to see a change and a transformation in this criminal legal system, if you see people who are fighting for that transformation, it's important where you can to uplift them let them tell their stories. And through them, like for me, I work with a lot of people who've been previously incarcerated who I've seen personally turn their lives around. And I would love nothing more than give them the opportunity to have the floor and the platform and to speak to their own experiences and the way that incarceration has destroyed generations of families. Um, it's important to create that space. And so going to the same people who you've always talked to, who feel very comfortable to you, um, those same system actors who may look like you, um, you're leaving out an opportunity to really engage with some of the people who can shed light on some of the things that you may not even understand or that members of the community may not understand. And so when we talk about this holistic approach, looking at everything, um, it's important too to look at you know interagency relations. So looking at prosecutor's offices and judges and how we interface with social services and Department of Behavioral Health Care Services, uh, probation and parole, that's really important because I don't know that our communities understand how not having housing, not having access to food security, not having access to adequate education or opportunity for employment. Um, and then some of the things that my counterparts on this panel talked about, dealing with unaddressed trauma, dealing with abuse, all of these things kind of get together and they create this environment where you're going to deal with the criminal legal system. Um, and so we too have to challenge those who are in positions of power, who have budget authority, who can think about adequately funding schools, housing, removing some of the barriers to you know, making sure that we're ending food insecurity. All of these things where we have seen communities not be invested in, Black communities, marginalized communities, people who the government has never intentionally invested in, um, it's time to have conversations about why. It's time to have conversations about, you know, where in our communities we're seeing people being failed and why are we constantly having this conversation about the meeting of people's needs at a very basic level? And why are we not having conversations about how communities of color, those who are marginalized, those who interface at a disproportionate rate with the criminal legal system, why are we not talking about how we see these communities thrive and not just surviving at a very basic level. And so these are some of the questions that people don't feel comfortable talking about. Um, these are the topics that people wanna shy away from and they never want to take responsibility for treating a black woman in a position of power differently than a white man, um, for, for making decisions, for trying to do something different to demand accountability, again, in this system that is content with holding members of the community accountable every single day. Uh, and I will share one more experience um, that I personally had that's a little bit more recent because that case was in 2015. So uh, this past summer, we had uh, a monument in our city and like many monuments around the country, um, our monument you know, was defaced and we had a situation where months after the incident at the monument, our police department took out charges. Now in Virginia, uh, we don't have intake offices in our prosecutor's offices. Police members of the community are able to go to a quasi-judicial official, the magistrate, and obtain felony warrants um, when they render probable cause to these officials. In my city, the police went, um, they took out these charges, they listed me as a witness on this witness list, and I was not present. 
um, that was a very clear uh, effort to try to have me removed from the case and bring on a special prosecutor, maybe someone who they will have a better outcome with. Um, I fought that. I had private counsel who represented me. Um, I ended up winning that motion to stay on the case. I ultimately retrieved all of the file information, learned that there was no adequate probable cause to charge these individuals, moved for dismissal with prejudice, um, and then ultimately saw all of these charges dismissed. Um, the really important thing about this was there was an example with Ryan Riley of the Huffington Post of a journalist who was paying attention to every single thing that was happening every step of the way. And when I couldn't speak because I'm not able to make extra judicial statements, because he was able to look at the public filings and pay attention to some of the wrongdoing that was happening and expose that, my community was able to remain informed and able to share information about what was happening. So while I have experienced some very hurtful things and some very harmful uh, reporting at times and some very targeted, um, unfortunate reporting, I have also seen very positive, amazing examples of what journalism can do when somebody is paying attention to an injustice um, and is really working to make sure that the public has accurate and complete information. Um, and the reason why that was so important was that, you know, this got a lot of attention nationally because there were NAACP officials, a state senator, our public defender who were all charged as a result of what happened at this monument with felony offenses. But what was more important to me was that it gave an example of how everyday people have to be subjected to a system where they could be charged with felony cases, they could be facing incarceration, and if there is no one there to ring the alarm, um, there's literally no opportunity for them to see justice. If there's no reporting, who's there to actually fight for them? And that would be me and the members of my office on a day-to-day -day basis. But in that instance, there was a reporter who was able to shed light on that situation and talk about what was going on and talk about the moves that system actors were taking. Um, and it, it gave my community the information that they needed to understand what was going on and to stay alert and stay aware. So um, I just challenge you all. I, I challenge myself every day to, to push for transformative change, but I challenge you all too, to push yourself to lean into these uncomfortable conversations that we have not had enough uh, in our nation, but that we can see the results and the outcomes when we don't have these conversations about racism and we don't uh, commit ourselves to, to really um, rooting out individuals who would harm us. Because when we are harming individuals in our community by incarcerating them when they shouldn't be, really we're taking away from our community's abilities to be healthy and successful as a whole. So thank you guys for being willing to just listen to some of us and our experiences. Um, and the knowledge that we have amassed and, and being open to thinking about how to be better at really working to, to you know, um, bring the truth in a different way. So that's really, thank you very much for that. That's really encouraging to hear. Uh, we really have a number of questions in our Q&A window, but let me start off. There's one thing that strikes me listening to all of you is that there are a number of audiences for reform. If we're talking about changing the framework of our criminal legal system, particularly our, our punishment system. We have the national community, obviously, the national audience, uh, which is very diffuse, hard to define. You have a local audience where each of you are uh, deeply involved in, and you have the local community where either the victim uh, or the perpetrator comes from. And very often these are, uh, these exhibit irreconcilable differences. And, and I'm wondering how you deal with that. And, and do you need to privilege one community over another in order to get the changes you think are necessary uh, in the system itself. Maybe I'll start with Judge Harris, who, you know, who's um, talked a lot about some of the pushback that she received. And I'm wondering uh, how, you, how she dealt with that and how you dealt with that. And also what the solution is, if you're really going to make some serious change. So I think one of the things that, that I talk a lot about and that I emphasize is uh, having a collaborative effort. Um, something that, you know, I, I refer to or think of as sort of a collaborative justice approach. And the only way that we can have this collaborative approach is if we are having conversations with all sides. And when I think about the New Orleans um, community in particular, when we're talking about 
the defendants who are in my courtroom and also the victims that are in my courtroom, oftentimes they are from the same community. And when I say right. same community, mm-hmm. I mean the same neighborhood, maybe a couple blocks <clears throat> from each other. And so oftentimes they aren't advocating for what um, what is being said <laughs> that or I guess, how am I going to say it? People are often dictating to them what justice looks like for them. And it's right. not true when you actually sit down and have a conversation with them. They know that this, yes, this individual is causing harm in the community, but they want to know, one, how we can stop this person from causing harm, but also if there is a underlying cause or underlying reason why that person is is committing that harm and how we can stop it from happening and how we can make the community as a whole healthier. And I think that's, they are oftentimes ignored. And that was what I found. One, as a public defender, I would often talk with victims in my office and they would say to me, I have reached out to the DA's office. I have reached out to the police. I don't want him to go to jail. I think he has a problem with this or with that, but I don't think that him going to prison for multiple years is going to be helpful or successful for him or for our community. So and, the, the, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. sorry, go ahead. And so so for me, I there actually hasn't <laughs> been, when we're coming to a lot of the cases that have been in front of me, the conflict hasn't really been between the two parties. It's people who are sort of speaking on behalf of individuals right. and they're not giving impacted folks an opportunity to have a voice in the system. And I I think that for me has been um, a realization that I had that we have to really start listening to. When I say impacted individuals, I'm not just talking about the defendants. And that was an assumption that people thought when I was talking about, you know, the the reforms and the systems. And so I had to explain to them, no, when I'm saying this, just because I, I did have a Uh, background as criminal defense attorney, when I'm referring to this, I'm talking about the community of New Orleans. That's who I'm talking about, the people of Mm -hmm. New Orleans and how we can help them as a whole, whether they are the defendant or the victim in the situation. The challenge really, as Professor Kelly, I think, pointed out, is that it's getting buy-in to a system that holds people accountable, but isn't Mm -hmm. retributive. And that's almost, you know, very hard enough to crack. And, And it's very hard, much less to describe in ways that satisfy so many of the different communities that are the audiences for this. Yep. Would you agree? I'll just, add, yeah. I'll just add one other piece. I think one of the keys too is just ensuring that decision makers are people who acknowledge the fact that we need to make sure that we're hearing the voices that need to be heard. And so right. that's why it's important for people, one, to participate in uh, voting, you know, to ensure that we have the folks that are in power are folks that are going to work together. One of the great things about what happened, and, and then I'll let I'll go let someone else speak, that happened was when I was elected to the bench, we also had a new DA elected to the bench who had a progressive platform. So I've been able to do a lot of things because there wasn't pushback from the DA's office. I've been able to exonerate people in my first year on the bench. I've been able to resentence individuals who were sentenced to life in prison and who now will have an opportunity to go home because the DA's office was willing to work with the defense attorneys and with, uh, with myself on those cases. So I think it's important to who's in power and how we're discussing those issues. Mm-hmm. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Professor Kelly? Sure. Um, it seemed like, it seemed to me that um, Judge Harris was raising the question that you were raising early on in her remarks by kind of raise, asking the question about how we ought to think about accountability in the criminal justice system. I think mm-hmm. we're all speaking to that in one way or another. You know, there's a need for a sense of accountability, but it should um, be a, set, a notion of accountability that's sensitive to, you know, all the relevant factors, which include not only the victim, but um, the community. What do we hold people accountable for? What does it mean to help hold them accountable? It seems like part of what we're saying is that a conversation about what the job of the criminal justice sh- system should be, should be a more inclusive conversation. It should be a wider conversation. More talk isn't always better. Um, Several of you have been pointing out the hurtfulness of the use of language in various ways, but the importance of widening the conversation. And, you know, one theme, it seems like in our discussion here is the need to view um, people who are accused of crimes and um, go through the system in a more holistic and 
dignified way, you know, to speak about them more respectfully. But it seems like the criminal justice system isn't very good at individualized justice. And I wonder how much of that work could happen in more local community-based ways rather than putting the state in charge of, you know, making these determinations about, I don't know, how to um, how to deal with people who break the law. Um, and it kind of makes me think back to the previous conversation where um, Christine Montrose was talking about mental illness. And, you know, like the criminal justice system is just not the best place to be dealing with problems of mental illness. So there are these kind of problem solving questions about the nature and limits of our institution and maybe the power of communities to take on more problem solving and have a bigger voice in some of these issues that are now just being just streamlined into the criminal justice system in a highly bureaucratic way um, that's not meeting the needs of people for individualized consideration and justice. Thank you. Can I add something, Can I add something to this? Yes, um, of I, I think we have to acknowledge too that um, our system knows how to give second chances. Uh, our system knows how to have a softer approach. Um, there are people who have committed crimes and they are met with equitable approaches or they are looked at as somebody who could potentially be, oh, this is a kid. This is my nephew. You know, he reminds me of my, you know, my, my little cousin. Um, let me, you know, continue this for 30 days and let him get himself together and pay something back and we'll dismiss it. Whereas for somebody else who looks like me, um, they're looking at a felony. So no, this system... Right. Um, knows how to give second chances when it wants to, just like the opioid epidemic. Um, you know, it, it's very comparable with things that we have seen in the past that was met with a different approach. So I think we also, we cannot now say, oh, we realize that this system, you know, is harsh and it's over, you know, punitive. It has been that way, but there are people who have been met with a softer approach and with second chances. And so I think we can't, if we're going to discuss this, we can't leave that out of the narrative. And, you know, I think that's important for journalists to understand and know as well that it's not just, you know, everyone who is suffering from this, but this has been disproportionately um, problematic for communities of color and marginalized communities. Thank you. So the lesson you take from that is what? Is that, you know, we're talking about communities, is that you have to listen to the community that you're uh, with the, with the uh, both the survivor and the, and the perpetrator comes from, rather than listen to the larger community which wants retribution. Well, also, you have to look at the data. And I think someone, I think it was Judge Harris who mentioned this, that you can want retribution and you can prefer a system of mass incarceration. It's not making us safer. So there's right. another conversation to be had as well about results. And if you want to be safer, you have to understand that we are simultaneously incarcerating too many people and we're not safe. So there, there's multiple facets to this conversation that need to be discussed. We have to, one, look at the harm that's being caused, absolutely. But we also have to look at the fact that we are spending a lot of money and that money could be better spent investing in communities for something that's not making us safer. Good point. I have a question for Dr. McKinney uh, from Melanie Eversley. Um, and she says the following, in recent years, society has begun to acknowledge a growing number of women, particularly Black women, uh, dying in custody. <coughs> one report, blames the lack of services in women's facilities to address addiction, trauma, and mental illness, uh, issues that you've already mentioned. But what are your thoughts on this trend? Why, why is it happening? Yeah, um, I just wanted to jump into the last uh, yes, question really quickly, though, and say um, we are not listening to everyone's voice, all of the stakeholders. There are certain voices that are being elevated, certain stories that are being elevated, not everyone's. Uh, Judge Harris said that when she was a defense attorney, she would sit across from victims and they would say, I don't want the person to be incarcerated. That what, that, what that person wanted is not always honored by our criminal legal system, right? There are cases in which DAs can move forward with a case and make that decision and it can be completely different from what a survivor or a victim wants. And so I think that's really important that if we actually start listening to all of the stakeholders, we will very likely see a very different system and very different ideas of justice than exists currently. Uh, and then related to this question, I think it's an incredibly important question. Um, there is just 
an extreme lack of services and in our prisons and jails. Um, particularly, you know, I think about mental health so much because so many of the women who are incarcerated um, su suffer from severe mental illness. Um, and these are uh, challenges that existed before they be were incarcerated and they did not have access to those services in the community. And then they are incarcerated and it may be the first time they are diagnosed or even given some kind of service and often it's minimal and poor quality. The women that we have worked with when they talk about mental health services say, all they ever did was medicate us. We never got therapy. No one ever talked to us and helped us work through what we experienced. So there is just a lack of investment in services and what does exist there just isn't enough for everyone. There are limited slots. And so we have prisons filled with people who come from communities that are um, experiencing concentrated disadvantage and divestment. They don't have these in their communities and then they're going into prisons, which cause additional harm. We work with folks who say, I survived prison in addition to be a, being a survivor of crime and violence prior. So they're going into these places that have, have very little services, a poor quality services at that, um, and then, you know, sent home. And when they're sent home, they're told, if they're sent home, they're told, you know, go find services. And we had one woman who said, when I got out, I had to call the prison to figure out where the services are in the community. So these are folks who in their communities, they had difficulty before they were incarcerated finding services. They didn't have access to the services when they were incarcerated. And then they still didn't have access to services afterwards. And we wonder why we have high recidivism rates and people are reincarcerated, right? It's because the services are not there and they need to be in our communities. We can't think about prisons and jails as being the places where people get them because what they're getting is subpar and we would not want anyone to have access to the quality of services that currently exist in our prisons and jails. That's a very key takeaway, I think. Two questions uh, for the judges in our group, uh, which I'll try to boil down. One is, um, how are experts thinking or perhaps rethinking uh, sentencing guidelines? Uh, and so far as you're able to um, move away from them or the plans you've got, uh, particularly the fines, but that's, that's, um, that's a different system, of course. But have other models worked uh, that you can adopt uh, or that you're using in your courtrooms? And uh, related to that, a smaller question is, um, how do you view alternatives to incarceration, such as electronic monitors? So who wants to take that first? Perhaps um, Stephanie Morales? Well, I'm not a judge. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to uh, respond. You know, when you think about sentencing guidelines and, you know, uh, different approaches that come forth in the courtroom, um, for me, it's important to note that this is a day to day struggle. Um, and I say struggle because um, when you are a reform minded, transformative, decarceral prosecutor who has been that way for going on seven years before there was any quote unquote progressive prosecutor movement, you are literally fighting in a system that does not understand what you're doing. And it's like, you know, also you have to have attorneys. I have to have attorneys who are committed to being in the courtroom with judges every day who are irritated um, because they want things to run quickly. They don't, you know, they are interested in the status quo, what they're used to. So pushing back, to go below the guidelines and, you know, fighting for transformative change outside of the courtroom. I've worked um, with the legislature, last legislative se session with a group of other Commonwealth attorneys in the state to try to change the law. Um, that hasn't been easy, but it has been critical. Um, so, you know, again, I'm not a judge. I, I cannot make these decisions myself, but every single day I try to instill in my attorneys, you know, that it's very important for them to work on every single case, every single time. And I think that's what we're gonna have to do is be committed to putting leaders in place who have the power and the authority to empower other people to on the ground level, on a case by case basis, treat people like they needed to be treat, like they need to be treated and focus on equity. Um, but trying to do these overreaching equality-based things, looking at one size fits all, this is how we can change and transform. It's not gonna have the impact that we want. 
and it may result in some incremental change, but to me, incremental change is still a failure. So can't speak from the judge's perspective, but from my perspective, it's a day-to-day -day individual fight, um, not only with my attorneys, but with the entire system that is pushing for that status quo. Thank you, sorry, I misspoke. What I meant to say is our two courtroom actors, but I will go to the judge now and ask uh, for her opinion. So I, one of the main things that I, um, that I've committed to doing is focusing on individualized justice because I think part of the problem and the way also that we have allowed so many biases and uh, disproportionate results to occur is by having a one size fits all and just this, this is the way we handle it. This is the way that we're going to do it. Um, but also acknowledging that when we do an individualized approach, biases are able to creep in as well because as uh, Dr. McKinney pointed out, you have individuals who have been given several chances, even when you look at who's allowed to participate in specialty courts. Um, there's a certain population of people who get that advantage. Um, but when it comes to sort of me and how I, I conduct my courtroom, one thing that's very important to me, and I, I've said this a few times now, is really looking at each person, but looking at the parts that make up that person. And so if I'm doing any sentencing, I require defense attorneys to give me as much information or mitigating information about that individual. But also when I'm looking at a file, I'm looking for certain context clues that I then ask questions about. So what I can't do is make the mistake of, oh, I see that this person has an extensive history. So I jump to a conclusion. No, then I ask follow-up questions. I say, I've noticed X, Y, and Z. Let's talk about that a little more or what's going on there. And then from there, try to figure out what's within my power and how we can help them uh, within my power. And if there are community-based solutions, that's my go-to, that's my first go-to. If I know that there is a community-based system that deals with mental health, or I know that there's a community-based situation, I talked earlier about being able to resentence individuals. I have had the privilege of resentencing several individuals that have served 20 plus years. But one thing that I know is that I can't just release an individual who's been incarcerated for 20 years without ensuring that we don't have a care plan or a rollout plan for that individual and not ensuring that there isn't a community-based component that can com provide those supports that are needed. And so those are things that I think about. And, uh, and most of the time, I'm not thinking about the carceral way that I can help this person because most of us know or agree that the way that our current carceral system is set up, it's not achieving what it needs to achieve. We aren't producing um, individuals that are even equipped or prepared to come back out once they've been in. I, I would even venture to say once someone has been incarcerated or away from their community for six months, a lot has changed. And how are we helping them transition back into it? But just being, also I have to just make sure that I'm aware of what services are available for individuals. So that way I can be creative when I'm doing my sentencing. And there are mandatory minimums. There's also, you know, what we call uh, the habitual offender bill. But again, with the DA that's currently in New Orleans, I don't have to worry about the habitual offender bill being applied to individuals because he's made a commitment not to do that. However, there are still some charges that have mandatory minimums. There is an opportunity, though, for an attorney to have what we call a Dorothy hearing, and that's an opportunity for me to determine as a judge if I will go below the mandatory minimum. And so I, you know, I, I give individuals an opportunity to let me know if there are factors or things that I need to pay attention to and why that person should not get the mandatory minimum. Um, and sometimes there are just some some charges that I, you know, judges have a lot of discretion, but our hands are tied in certain situations. And so I can't just unilaterally say, I'm not going to give this person the mandatory minimum. There is a, a process that does have to play out. And so just ensuring that lawyers are 
also being zealous advocates for their clients is important um, to under, for them to understand as well. Um, but there are some avenues, but I think really just being conscious of myself and thinking, have I looked at everything I need to look at? Have I made any assumptions that I need to uh, clarify? Um, and, you know, it, it's just a day-to-day -day basis. But really the thing that I think is most important for me is not falling into this, you know, um, automated sort of conveyor belt of justice that's been going on for so long. Thank you. So we have about two minutes left. And I, what I'd like to do is go around the room, the virtual room, and ask you one other question. Uh, let's just pose a question I love uh, when, it's, when it's posed to our panels. What stories aren't we telling? Um, maybe if I can ask each of you to just give us one example of the time we've got. Uh, perhaps start with um, Dr. McKinney and then um, Professor Kelly, uh, Ms. Morales, and then Judge Harris. Uh, I, I think that the stories that we aren't telling are the stories of women of color, particularly Black women who are being criminalized um, by police and um, also incarcerated. Um, there are so many instances that are horrific. I saw a story just the other, just this before um, from the Marshall Project, elevating a story about a black girl who was ripped off of her a bike by a police officer. Like we need to be telling these stories. And one of the things I have heard so often is we don't elevate the stories of black women and girls who are being criminalized and policed because the, the frequency with which that occurs is less than that of black men. And so we presume that because the frequency isn't as great that the severity and the impact is not the same. And yet that is not true. And so we need to continue to be elevating these stories of black women and girls who are being directly impacted by our criminal legal system instead of believing that they're just collaterally impacted by the criminalization of black men because that's, that's just not what's happening. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kelly? Sure. Um, I think my my thought connects with um, with Sydney McKinney's thought in, in this way. I think that, um, you know, stories about crime and justice are so sensationalized in the media um, and it's the most dramatic cases that draw our attention. Um, but what we really need to keep in mind and to think about are the ways in which ordinary people who have experienced a criminal conviction um, have their whole life impacted by that um, criminal conviction and to understand the life-changing nature of um, a criminal record for an ordinary person. Um, I think that that's really worth thinking about. Thank you, C.A. Morales. Um, so I think, you know, a combination of, those, you know, who have been impacted by incarceration through their family members. So the tales of children who've been impacted, parents, um, what that does to family and community in conjunction with the system actors um, who are responsible for placing them there in times when, um, you know, it was a, a malfeasance. So those wrongful convictions, those types of stories, we hear about the wrongful convictions. We don't hear enough about those system actors who have taken part in those wrongful convictions. So I would like to see those stories. And in addition, I would like to hear the stories about the people who are cleaning it up, black women, elected prosecutors around the country, judges, advocates, um, who are fighting in the trenches, oftentimes being criticized, never any word about the work they're doing to try to undo as many harms as possible. Thank you. And Judge Harris, you have the last word. Um, I, I agree with what everyone has said so far. I think it's going to be very important if we're talking about reframing the framework to lift up work that is trying to be done in the communities and how it's having a positive impact. Um, I think that it's going to be very important as well to, you know, and I've said this several times, so it's just making sure that directly impacted people are part of the voices when stories are being told let's not tell it always from the most common voices. Let's hear from the people who are directly impacted. And those are the people that are living in the communities and that live with the decisions that the decision makers are making every day. And so I think that that's going to be vital and that's very important 
And again, I think as journalists, it's important to understand that oftentimes the only time a person has an experience with the criminal court system is when they read your article about it. And so that's going to be important for them to get a full picture of what's actually going on in the courtrooms. And I think there should be additionally, just more information about what's happening day to day in the courtrooms. So we have an organization um, here, it's called Court Watch NOLA, and they do a report every year about what's going on in the courtrooms. Because again, not everyone can come into court, but if there's a report with people who are there dedicating their time to, and they have a rubric, so it's a very standardized process, but it allows the community and everyone to know what's going on and to hold all of those actors accountable. Now the court watch is a, a spreading phenomenon, I think in a lot of cities right now. It's very, it's very useful and worth watching, but I think we're gonna to have to stop it there, but I wanna thank all of you for the time you spent and for some really, really uh, interesting and stimulating ideas. We do have some questions that are filtered in at the last moment, but I will bundle them and send them to you guys and you can answer them and we'll send them back to our, our journalists. But thank you again. I hope you'll stay with us for our last panel, which is coming up shortly. Um, but again, thanks so much. Appreciate you being here. You. We'll take a short, thank another you. another 10 minute break and we'll be back in uh, 410. Thank you.